Merlin Acor was an American hero. He would distinguish himself during World War II by performing field surgery while injured and under intense fire. For his actions, he was awarded the Navy Cross, Silver Star, and Purple Heart. In this video, I will share his amazing story. Merlin Farr Acor was born on the 24th of April, 1920 in Kansas City, Missouri. He was the elder son born to Dr. Noah Acor and Clara Jane Farr Acor. The family would move to Brownwood, Texas in 1928, following Clara's graduation from Kirksville College of Osteopathy and Surgery. Clara became a doctor herself after helping put her husband Noah through medical school. Noah and Clara would practice medicine in Brownwood. Clara was the only licensed female physician in the area at the time. Merlin would spend the rest of his youth there, becoming an Eagle Scout in 1934 and graduating Brownwood High School in 1938. After graduation, he followed in his parents' footsteps towards a career in medicine. He attended Howard Payne College and Daniel Baker College, both in Brownwood, for pre-med studies. He would then move on to his parents' alma mater in Kirksville to become a doctor. While attending Kirksville, Merlin was part of a youth church group. On one outing, the group took a winter sleigh ride through the Missouri countryside. He found himself sitting next to a vivacious redhead, and they fell for each other immediately. Merlin was an outstanding medical student, and Eileen was studying to be a teacher. They married on the 4th of July, 1942. Acor graduated Kirksville Phi Beta Kappa on the 15th of March, 1943. He immediately volunteered for the United States Navy, enlisting in Abilene, Texas on the 6th of April, 1943. He was enlisted as a pharmacist mate second class and was initially stationed at the San Diego Naval Hospital as an assistant in plastic surgery. By April of 1944, he was with the Marines at the Naval Hospital on the grounds of Camp Pendleton in Oceanside, California. First listed as a student, he advanced to field instructor by October of 44. Acor left the States in November of 1944 for overseas service, which would see him first in Maui in the territory of Hawaii, and then on to Iwo Jima, Japan. While Merlin was now off to fight the war overseas, Eileen was fighting the war on the home front. Following countless other Rosie the Riveters, Eileen entered the workforce. She would spend the rest of the conflict at a plant in Kansas City, Missouri, building the materials needed to win the war. After the Allies completed the seizure of the Philippines in December 1944, their next objective was to capture Iwo Jima, one of the Japanese volcano islands, 750 miles south of Tokyo. Iwo Jima wouldn't have been part of the Americans' plans if not for the two airstrips on the island. The Japanese were using them to stage attacks on the Mariana Islands, which had been captured by the Americans in August of 1944. The airstrips would also allow the Japanese to intercept American B-29 bombers as they made attacks on Japan. The capture of the island would eliminate those problems. It would also give the Americans the ability to station P-51 Mustang fighters close enough to escort and protect the bombers as they operated over the Japanese home islands. The Japanese commanders knew they could not win the coming battle on Iwo Jima. Their goal was to inflict as many casualties on the Americans as possible. They hoped this action would make the Americans and their allies reconsider an invasion of the Japanese home islands. The Japanese laid countless landmines, built hundreds of concealed artillery and mortar positions, along with camouflage sniper nests and hidden machine gun positions. They also dug a large network of tunnels to allow Japanese troops to move around undetected. Even with all those preparations, the Japanese were still short on supplies, a common problem for them at this stage of the war. U.S. Marine commanders initially requested 10 days of heavy shelling on Iwo Jima leading up to the Marine landings. The Navy pushed back on this request, and begrudgingly they agreed upon a three-day bombardment. After this short bombardment, D-Day on Iwo Jima was 19th February 1945. The Marines, with the Navy Seabees, hit the beaches at 0859, one minute ahead of schedule. Beyond the beaches, they were greeted with high slopes of black volcanic ash that was hard to get a footing on and impossible in which to dig foxholes. The first hour saw little resistance from the Japanese as they were allowing the Marines to concentrate their presence on the island. By 10 hundred hours, the Japanese began a furious counterattack raining mortars, machine guns, and heavy artillery on the crowded beaches. The Japanese defenses allowed them to rain a hellish amount of artillery fire on the Americans and make any counterattack difficult. The Japanese tunnel system allowed them to quickly reoccupy any pillbox the Americans were able to clear. U.S. commanders in Pearl Harbor grossly misjudged the situation leading up to the invasion of Iwo Jima. They thought that the beaches were excellent for landing and a push inland would present few difficulties. Commanders also thought that the action against Iwo Jima over the preceding months had decimated the Japanese garrison and defenses on the island. The Marines were now finding out just how wrong they were. As the invasion began, Acor would distinguish himself in battle, earning the Silver Star and Navy Cross. Soon after landing on the island, Acor served in a battalion aid station. 
Quoting from the Silver Star Citation, During this period, he coolly rendered expert first aid treatment to the wounded under heavy mortar fire, which caused numerous casualties in the vicinity of the aid station. When casualties on the front lines were extremely heavy, a Corps volunteered to replace a seriously wounded company aid man. Joining a strange company at a time when the initial shock of combat was present in all, a Corps, by his determination and courage, inspired all who observed him. End quote. He was now the company aid man of Company G, 2nd Battalion, 24th Marines of the 4th Division, and would further distinguish himself on D-Day Plus 5, 24th February, 1945. Quoting the Navy Cross Citation, In an attempt to reach a Marine who had been wounded by enemy machine gun fire, pharmacist mate 2nd Class A Corps left his shelter position and with utter disregard for his personal safety ran directly into the line of enemy fire. After advancing five yards, he was hit by enemy machine gun fire. Despite agonizing pain, he persisted in his attempt to reach the wounded man once again and was himself wounded, this time seriously. Weak from loss of blood and exhausted by his efforts to maintain his footing in the loose volcano sand, pharmacist mate 2nd Class A Corps finally reached the wounded Marine and then, still under intense fire, administered life-saving first aid. Although he himself required immediate medical attention, pharmacist mate 2nd Class A Corps refused to leave the front lines until he had dragged his patient to safety and directed his evacuation to the battalion aid station. By his courage and efforts in behalf of others at great risk to his own life, pharmacist mate 2nd Class A Corps undoubtedly saved the life of a comrade, and his steadfast devotion to duty throughout was in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. End quote. A Corps earned the Purple Heart for his injuries that day as well. His unit was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. The citation was awarded to units that displayed gallantry and determination at a level that set it above other units in the same engagement. Allow me to expand on ACOR's experience on Iwo Jima. ACOR landed after the bloody initial counterattack by the Japanese. Along with other corpsmen, his first assignment was to take cardboard boxes to the beach's battle site strewn with the blasted remains of the Marines and Seabees. He found a dog tag and then located the nearest body part or piece of flesh. The distorted remains of that person were placed in the box. In turn, those small makeshift coffins were sent to grieving loved ones for military burial. He would then move on to a battalion aid station. At the outset of the battle, an aid station was mere feet from the front lines and was a shell hole or something similar, either open or covered with a tarp, and they were a favorite target of the Japanese. A Corps was part of one unit of about a dozen corpsmen working under a surgeon and rendering medical care to injured Marines and Seabees under near constant mortar explosions. During the battle's second day, the company aid man for Golf Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Marines of the 4th Division, went down, and Merlin volunteered to replace him. Now he was even closer to the front lines of the brutal battle. His next days, as the Marines were advancing north, were spent patching up the wounded and getting them moved to the rear for further medical treatment. All of this occurred while he was under constant, heavy enemy mortar and machine gun fire. On D-Day Plus 5, the Marines were again making a push against the Japanese. The 2nd Battalion of the 24th Marines were on the right flank of the line near the island's east coast. They were attempting to gain ground in the area of Charlie Dog Hill. The fighting was unbelievably intense. As the battle raged, a Corps spotted a Marine who had been injured in the neck and needed immediate medical attention. He left his cover and headed towards the wounded man, under fire and trying to get through the mire that was the volcanic black ash. He gets hit by enemy machine gun fire, but he keeps going. He gets hit again, this time more seriously, but he still keeps going. He arrives at the Marine, and now while losing blood, exhausted, and in extreme pain, performs a tracheotomy with nothing more than a scalpel and piece of tubing to allow the Marine to breathe, all of this while still under heavy fire from the enemy. Struck twice, severely injured, he performed field surgery under fire. And then he still refuses treatment until he gets his patient out of harm's way and headed to an aid station. His patient cared for, Merlin was then attended to. His time in combat was through. He had done his service for our great nation. Merlin would be sent back stateside, back to Oceanside. This time, he returned as a patient to recover from his near-mortal wounds. Eileen would join him there, to be by his side while he regained a more normal state of health, mind, and strength. She would later remark that this was the happiest time of their marriage. After his discharge, Merlin hurried to meet his wife back in Kansas City, anxious to take her home to Texas. After what he had experienced in the war, he just wanted to get home to start a family and a new life. They had tried previously to bear a child, but were unsuccessful. 
At one point, they would drop to their knees together and pray that a child would be theirs. In February of 1946, their prayers were answered with the birth of their daughter, Judith. They would be further blessed in January 1948 with a son, Joseph. The wound Merlin received at Iwo Jima caused permanent nerve damage in his left arm and prevented him from becoming a surgeon. He would go into private practice, first interning in Clarendon, Texas with Drs. Keith and Laura Lowell. He then passed the examination by the Texas State Board of Medical Examiners in March of 1946. As a member of the Texas Association of Osteopathic Physicians and Surgeons, he was the District 4 Chairman of the Public and Professional Welfare Committee. Eileen would become an elementary school teacher. Both Judith and Joseph would follow her into careers in education. Judy, like her mother, would teach at the elementary level in California and Pennsylvania. Joe would become a professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Baylor University. Most of Merlin Acor's civilian career, he operated a clinic or small hospital in small Texas towns. He owned and ran clinics in Amarillo, Plainview, Turkey, as well as Tyler in East Texas. At the time, he made house calls and on occasion took chickens or other goods in trade for professional service. In Plainview, he ran a six-bed hospital clinic where he ministered to countless farm workers. He never claimed disability compensation from the United States. What I did, I did for my country. He recalled his time of service as some of the best years of his life, noting the shared sense of mission and the camaraderie of other soldiers. At the end of life, he left a remarkable legacy as a doctor and as a soldier. Merlin Acor was a true American hero. Not only would Judy become an educator, she would also become my aunt, marrying my mom's brother, Russell. It is their influence and encouragement that fostered my love of history, which led to this video, the ones that have preceded it, and those that will follow. This video is dedicated to Aunt Judy and Uncle Russ with love and gratitude for all that you have done for me.